plus 10 science per temperate. But wait, there's more! Also applies for planets on sanctuary systems. So what that means is that the sanctuaries you create automatically benefit from that upgrade being built in your main system. That's why we have a lot of penalties, because we only have to build most of our improvements once, but we get to reap the rewards on every planet we have a sanctuary on. Let's get good! I am the Gamer Under Development, and it is my absolute pleasure today to be able to present to you the beta of Endless Space 2 Penumbra. So this is the loading screen, or not the loading screen, but the new intro screen. I just wanted to show it to you guys because I think it's super cool. I love the design for the Umber Choir. Their ships are just beautiful, and I love this new loading screen. Okay, so we've got a game set up here. Here are all of our settings. I'm just going to run through them real quick so you can see what they are, and then we'll get into the game, and I'll show you guys the Umbral Choir, some of their faction stuff, and we'll get rolling with it so you can really see how they work because they're super fun, guys. Uh, okay, so we've got four competitors. We're on fast speed, endless difficulty, hard pirate difficulty. We are on a disc four, small galaxy, few constellations, high galaxy density. That's just a quick rundown of what our settings are. So now we're going to jump in. I'm going to shut up when the cinematic comes up so you guys can all see that and appreciate it. If you haven't yet, it is definitely cool. So if you haven't checked this out, enjoy it. If you have, feel free to skip ahead like 30 seconds till we dive into the in-game stuff, okay? For as long as we could remember, the cosmos was quiet, peaceful. Until one shattering day, we heard the death cry of a galaxy. It was then we understood our purpose to heal and bring peace to whatever life had risen from the aftermath. Song sounds familiar for some reason, doesn't what it? What the? What is that? Command, this is Pioneer Nine. I'm picking up something weird. Over. Pioneer Nine, this is Command. Nothing registering on our end. Can you confirm? Over. Command, there's definitely something out there. It looks alive. It's getting closer. Command, spoopy, scary smokatons. Help. It's Oh, here we go. Say again, Pioneer 9. Pioneer 9, say again. Right Yo. Okay, that's my favorite cinematic so far, guys. That is my favorite cinematic so far. And incredibly accurate to what we're we're gonna be doing with the Umbral Choir. Okay, so now that we're in, we're gonna start up here and just take a real quick look at the faction as a whole so that I can give you guys a little explanation on what's different about them, and we can really take a second to appreciate how awesome they are. First of all, they do start as a democracy. That is a pacifist democracy. However, I believe their first hero is a science hero, which we'll get to. Anyway, let's take a look at what the Umbral Choir is. They are an ancient, ah, an ancient immaterial creature from the depth of intergalactic space. The Umbral Choir roamed the cold, empty ways terribly alone until a great cry of anguish pierced the darkness. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I don't want to spoil it for you guys, but that's just a real quick intro. Let's look at their faction affinity, which is called In the Shadows. Possesses a hidden home system located on a special node that can be migrated to another special node for a cost. Okay, so this is one of the key features that's different about the Umbral Choir, guys. They get one system, and I'll show it to you right now, and we'll come back to this. This is our one system. You'll notice that the node we're on is a nebular cloud. Typically, you cannot have anything on a nebular cloud. These guys get to break that rule. I will, however, point out a very important thing that people get confused with the Umbral Choir a lot during this beta, 
And that is, see how it says effects, 10 production, 10 science, 10 dust, 10 influence? I don't actually get that even though we're here. You only get that if you have a transmigration beacon in that system, which is something I'll show you in a second. But anyways, yeah, they get one system, this is it. However, this system is stealth. Other players cannot see this system without researching detection, which is super interesting because you kind of live in a separate galaxy from everyone else until detection becomes a thing later. Uh, or if you get yourself caught, which we'll get into later. Okay, so let's go look at their other stoof. Uh, they cannot colonize systems in the normal fashion, but they're able to place hidden sanctuaries. We'll get into that. Essentially, you can hack planets that you would normally be able to settle with a different faction. Uh, and instead of settling them, you create sanctuaries there. And then, this is the interesting part, other factions can then settle on that planet. And if you have a sanctuary there, you essentially just gain the ability to spy on them. It's like having a back door for the hacking. It's really good. Uh, well, it's not like having a back door for the hacking because that's an actual mechanic. But you essentially have eyes everywhere. It's a really good thing, and we'll get to that later as well. You guys will see it. Can abduct sleeper agents from enemy populations to bring them back to home system as enhanced population. Okay. So here's the deal. The Umbral uh, Choir has two different types of population, but we'll get into that in a second when we look at their population. One of the things they can do when you hack an enemy system is you can convert one of their pop into a sleeper. Then if you hack them again, you can abduct that sleeper back to your home system and it basically becomes an Umbral Shadow, which is like a super pop. Uh, they produce a lot more resources and stuff. You'll see. Umbral Choir are immune to influence conversions. However, their ships can be attacked in Cold War even when on their home system. So, yeah, that's just another one of those little gotchas. Because they have one system, they're immune to uh, cultural com or influence conversion because that would be nuts. Uh, however, as it says, you can be attacked in your home system during Cold War because once they find you, you're at risk. And that is a big part of our gameplay mechanics. It's not as much of a weakness as it sounds like, but it is an interesting weakness. Uh, so then we've got the immaterial population, which is minus 75% food to manpower on systems. This sounds really bad. It does, but it's not, and we'll get to why in a second. Dark Matter Manipulators. Plus 0.5 manpower from idle bandwidth on Empire. That's actually super useful and helps to counteract immaterial population. However, the reason immaterial population isn't super relevant is so much better, guys. We'll get there very soon. Uh, okay, Organic Network. Plus one maximum hacking operations on Empire, that's super important for them and it's also super useful. And typically, whenever we get one of these new DLCs, we get a new faction and everybody else gets to do the new thing, but they do it better and that's what that is. That's us doing hacking better. Fledgling Traders, minus 50% star system trade value on system. Pretty heavy penalty there, you'll see why in a second, I promise it's worth it. Uh, Twitch Infiltrators, plus 10% hacking speed on Empire, once again, we do it better. Uh, ghosts. All ships can be cloaked except obliterators and juggernauts. That is hugely, hugely cool. That is a super, super useful mechanic. Uh, and there's actually a technology that they get later on that allows you to put a module on ships, and as long as they stay cloaked in space, they generate science. This is a very science-focused faction. Uh, exploited sleepers. Plus one bandwidth per sleepers on Empire. That thing we were talking about a second ago where you can plant a sleeper, for every one of those sleepers you get another bandwidth, which is useful. Titanium Mine. You start with a Titanium Mine deposit on your home planet, Hyperium Source on your home planet. Those are very, very useful, obviously. Uh, expensive Tastes. Plus 100% system development luxury cost on Empire. Sounds huge, but you gotta remember, you're only building those one time in your one system. Not as much of a penalty as it sounds like, more of a balancing thing. Now here's where we get to the really cool part, guys. We start with Xenobiology and Planetary Landscaping, but I want to take a second to look at our version of Xenobiology, because it differs in one very important way from everybody else's. So we've got plus 10 science per fertile, plus 10 science per planet, plus 10 science per temperate, but wait, there's more! Also applies for planets on sanctuary systems. So what that means is that the sanctuaries you create automatically benefit from that upgrade being built in your main system. That's why we have a lot of penalties, because we only have to build most of our improvements once, but we get to reap the rewards on every planet we have a sanctuary on. That is super powerful, uh, which is why we have those negatives to sort of balance that out. That being said, it's a super great mechanic. It, it's very enjoyable and it's very fun to try to balance it, and you'll get to see some of that as we dive in. 
Uh, sorry that took so long, but I wanted to make sure that everybody had a good understanding of the new faction before we dive in headlong. Uh, we're gonna go into our science right here, and I was wrong. Our first hero is a pacifist, which is unfortunate because we really want to be scientists. Uh, so we will be looking to stay with our scientific party. That'll sort of happen naturally, though. We tend to do a lot of science-focused things. I'm gonna start here by taking Dirty Hands Act. Uh, that minus 10 to system improvements is actually really useful when you only have one system to build the improvements, because once they're done, they're done. And you can go ahead and drop that. So let's go into our population details. And here you can see that our base population produces one science and one bandwidth, as well as some pacifist output. Now, at 10, we get more pacifist output. At 20, we get plus one influence per allocated bandwidth. So the more bandwidth we're using, the more influence we get. And we get an additional plus 15 bandwidth on Empire, which is great. And then at 50, we get plus 15% hacking speed. That is super important, guys, because the thing that decides whether or not you're detected is essentially hacking speed. Hacking speed is whether or not you can get in and out before you get caught. You can get in, succeed at a hack, and still get caught on your way out. Hacking speed will prevent that from happening. Uh, so it's a very, very useful thing for us to have. And as you can see, this is Umbral Choir population, not Umbral Shadows, which we'll get to later. Uh, that being done, we'll move on to our Market tab, where we don't have anything to do right now. Research tab. So this is what we're going to do. Science victory is normally a very hard victory to achieve in these games. We're going to go for that. We already know we have Titanium and Hyperium in our starting system, so we're going to start by researching Xenolinguistics. The reason we start with Xenolinguistics is because, if you'll notice, this is a special Umbral Choir tech. And this version of the tech includes also applies for planets on Sanctuary Systems. We want all of those. All of those things get built immediately because that's where our power lies. Now, as you can see, we're already on tier two of these other things because we do have science as a political party. So what we're going to do is we are going to try to get the minimum techs on every branch of every tree, except for right here where we really need that titanium and hyperium. And the only reason we're going for these so early is because the sooner we get these up, the sooner we can go after the endless research park, which is plus 20% science and plus 15% science, depending on your faction happiness. Uh, so we really want to get that first, because we want that science burst if we're going to be trying to go for our science victory. So what I've done is I've picked those two techs. We already have one in these. We could get one in military here, but we won't need that super early on, because all of our ships are cloaked. So instead, I'm going to go after Eukaryotic Sap here, and the reason I'm going for that is because we get this Accelerator Offensive Hacking Program that will increase our hacking speed. And then I'm also going to go for Baryonic Shield here, which will give us access to this piggyback program, which reduces the bandwidth costs on hacking programs. That's less important. I'm more going for the Curiosity thing right here, and also for this uh, free movement, which is going to be huge, because with our ability to hack our way to planets, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get all the choicest planets we can find before other people settle them so that we're basically already in their network. That's the plan, guys. Uh, and I'm, I'm super excited, because when it works, it works amazingly. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our basic ship. This is our cord. This is our exploration ship. It starts with a three-point engine, which is excellent, because it means we don't need to upgrade it. Uh, this is important. When we look at our improved probes here, you'll notice it says four-turn cooldown. These are only a two-turn cooldown. The reason why is because these ships are very fast, they get plus two speed, and they have plus 100% probe recovery rate because they're an explorer. So these things move quick, guys. We're talking 10 movement with how many probes? Four probes and a probe cooling down every other turn. Very, very good exploration ships. This is what we do as the Umbral Choir. We didn't even need to upgrade those, which is another important thing to think about. Uh, here is our hero. We're going to go ahead and upgrade his ship just a little bit, though. We give him another engine, and we're going to give him... Actually, we're going to give him those. The reason being that we can actually separate him off from the other fleets and use him just for exploration. We're not going to need him much for combat early on. In fact, one of the things we should do while we're in here is we should look at these special Umbral Choir branch skills. So we'll look at those real quick too. Uh, tier 1, we have plus 5 bandwidth on Empire, 2 levels of that. We also have plus 10% evasion on fleet. This is cool. This is one of the first factions to really push evasion on fleets. So that's an interesting mechanic for us to see. Two levels of that, so we're going to guess plus 10, plus 20, maybe? 
Uh, then we have overclock scanners, which is plus vision range on fleets. This is useful because if you can see it, you can hack it. Uh, this Vox Populi is one we've seen in a few other trees, plus 5% production on system. That's still really great for us. Uh, this is an interesting new one. Set the fleet anti-cloaking level to 3 on fleet. So if they are a fleet commander, they basically can auto-detect camouflage units. Very, very useful. This is one that we make this first guy a governor and a senate leader for. And that is uh, Fast and Furious here. We get minus 10% bandwidth cost on hacking programs if he's a political leader. But even if he's just on the system, we get plus 5% hacking speed on Empire, which is, once again, a way to get in and get out without getting caught. Uh, and then our last skill here is the Nocturnal Sleepers on system. You get plus 1% Fidzy per sleepers on system. That's how big of a thing that is. Uh, the more sleepers we get, the more incremental advantage that'll generate. Also worth noting, they do start off with a bonus of plus 10 influence on system. That may be for everyone, but I just noticed that. Uh, and influence is actually a really big thing with us, and you will see why if we get fortunate here. So let's look at where we started out. We've done all of our things here. We're going to go ahead and add our, our uh, governor or our fleet commander, rather, at this point. To this fleet just so that we can do some scanning here and get him a little extra experience so let's see what else we have going on that's sad that was a negative outcome positive outcome negative outcome sad times so we got nothing uh, what is this one 20 titanium that'll help us get to the uh, endless research park faster expedition failed okay we are on a neutron or we've discovered a neutron star here has been recruited we know that uh, we have super spuds available to us somewhere. I don't know where though, unless we just got those when we were scanning. So let's go in and do our uh, production queue real quick. We're gonna go ahead and throw Cerebral Reality in just because science is our lowest thing and I usually try to shore up our lowest thing first. Then we'll go Drone Network to get our base production building, after which we'll do food and then science. Now, once again, our food receives a penalty to manpower, so it's actually really important that we build food, but there is one other very very special reason why we build food and i'm not sure if it'll tell us about it here or if it tells us about it down here uh where does it speak about this ships constructing the system i know it says it somewhere but essentially uh population for the umbral choir works very different from everyone else Essentially what happens with them is they generate population based on how much food they're producing, but here's the catch. They can produce more than one population per turn. Now what they'll do is they'll seek to fill out your home system, but if your home system is filled out, I believe it sends population to the lowest population uh, sanctuary that you have. Now this is where it gets interesting. It can send multiples at time though, or at the same time though. So say you have two with zero, you might end up with three in one of them the next turn instead of having you know one one and then one you'll just end up with three in one of them because you can produce multiple pops per turn however this selected sanctuary thing right here will actually let us define that sanctuary as the place we want our ships to be constructed at so sanctuaries are also force projection things and even better it'll let us decide where our population goes which is more important really okay so that stuff is all built up and ready to go we have our hero assigned obviously we're gonna want to go down to sable we could start hacking this right away and we may i'm gonna actually take this fleet that has all of its movement and move it down here and see what it can come up with uh we should also take a look at where we are in the galaxy all right so disc galaxy there's liable to be things this way things this way and potentially some stuff around this outer edge one of the things that's really incredible about this faction as a whole is that if you manage to find a system that is off these lines, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, and the reason why it makes a huge difference is because you can set up a transmogrific... Transmig... I'm sorry. Transmogrification. Transmigration beacon on one of those systems that's sort of off of the paths, and then what ends up happening is you can move your home system there and nobody can even find you unless they send a probe out or just happen to glance and find that system. So that's a nice, nifty little trick you can use. The wider cosmos, the Umbral Choir was drawn to the endless galaxy when it heard a 
chorus of suffering coming from the stars therein. Curious to learn and heal, it watches from the darkest places, attempting to make peace with its own new, discordant nature. I like the voice acting for this faction, but I don't know if this is the final voice acting because it's the beta. When I first got into the beta, they didn't even have their video yet. Like, honestly, uh, I saw the tail end of the video at the announcement stream, and that's the first time I've got to watch the whole intro video, and I, I absolutely loved it. I hope you guys enjoyed it, too, because I thought it was cool. Uh, let's send him down this way, or actually, no, we'll go there so that he can get some scans in there and potentially get some more levels. Uh, and now we're going to move on to the new hacking mechanic. So this is important, guys. I could go up here and click this economy scan button, but I can also just press space. Just use your space bar, it's a lot faster. This is interesting because as the Umbral Choir, you spend more time on this view than this view. You almost live in the economy view. Uh, so when we come in now, you can see that they've also made some very different changes to the economy view now. We can actually look at our system and see what resources are being produced there based on our economy view. We can see the happiness, I believe, of the population. We can zoom in here and uh, get some more information about the trading and such. Look at that, population synergies, all sorts of great information now available here that wasn't previously. Uh, but we also have this new hacking stuff. So one of the first things we're gonna do is we're going to decide, or I mean, assign a defensive hacking program, which is encrypt. This will make it harder for somebody to hack this Okay, so this is one of the ways we get detected, actually. This is a good time to talk about detection. When we get detected, one of the ways that it happens is they hack that system thinking that it's just an empty special node, and then they find us. Like, that's what happens. So what this encrypt defensive program will do is if they try to hack that system, they'll fail, and we'll trace them back instead. That will hopefully keep them from finding our system. So we're putting this on right away just to keep ourselves safe, and then we're going to begin hacking. Now this is another important point right here. Here's how we do our hacking. We click on the, the system or the place we want to initiate the hack from and then we go to the place that we want to do the hack. So we'll go right there because it's the only option we actually have right now. Like we can't really hack Sable because there's nothing there. We don't have vision on anything else. So I'm going to hack this just so I can show you guys what this does. Honestly, I'm not sure that we even want this node though. So we will see if I... Mm, Mm. See, this is annoying, though. If we cancel that hacking operation, we'll lose all the progress and we'll incur a 30 bandwidth penalty for three turns. Uh, but as you can see, our bandwidth is off the hook, so it's not really a big concern. I'm just sort of debating if that system is even worth us getting it. Plus one influence and plus one science per pop. It's not terrible. We'll go ahead and take it, but there's a better one we're looking for early game. Uh, so for right now, that's going to have to be good enough. Okay, we are on to the second turn. I promise it's going to get faster now, guys. A lot of that was just explaining new mechanics and stuff, because uh, I didn't want you guys trying to figure out what's going on and not having a clue, because there's so much new stuff. Uh, all right, you guys are going to go do the searching things. Yeah, search that one. And that one. And that one. Uh, and you can't search anymore, sadly. So let's see what we got. 50 Empire Dust is good. Uh, another 150 Empire Dust. What do we got here? Titanium Enhancer Module. Empire has Dusidious Trees available to it now. And level up for our hero. We're going to go ahead and put our first point into the bandwidth increase. Now, we don't actually need that bandwidth right now. The reason we're getting that is because one of our faction quests will actually be based around that. Uh, so what do we want to do here? We could scan some more... Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, scan one of these planets with this fleet, and then we'll move them on to the next area and see what we can find. Got some colonizable planets here with resources on them, which is excellent. We really want these. Uh, so we'll probably be sending a hack out this way as soon as we finish doing all the other things we're doing this turn. Go explore, find all the things. What are you? 50 dust, that's not great. What we really want, and this is the one we're keeping our eyes out for right now, is we want the 50 influence special node. 50 influence per turn in the early game is the difference between having a full loadout of good laws and struggling with influence. Uh, if we get that, we will basically not have to worry about influence until very late in the game, which is why I find it so powerful and so worthwhile to get in the first place. 
Uh, let me check something out here. Nah, we'll just send them both down here. Go ahead, guys. It's okay if it takes you a few turns to get there. Uh, it would be good to get this, maybe, but we'd rather hold out for something better. I would be more inclined to get this if we didn't have any good uh, staging systems nearby, but we'll be getting Staterus here, which means that we can stage our hacks out of there. Because what we want to eventually be able to do is send all of our hacks out from somewhere other than our home system. Because sending hacks out from our home system, if they get detected, can be traced back to us, which is one of the ways that we can reveal our home system, which we don't really want to do. So there we are. Looks like we're going to be done with that hack in one turn. The early influence and science gain from that might actually be healthful. Health, healthful. Helpful. Uh, okay, so here we go. We can install our transmigration beacon. So let's read what this does real quick. Transmigration beacons are a destructive but effective means of moving your main system at short notice. Placed on special nodes, the beacons act as a special receiver for high entropic digital snapshots that allow the relocation of the entire system with a cost to population and infrastructure if they are not fully charged. Create a transmigration beacon, allocating 10 bandwidth in the process. That's if they're not fully charged, guys. So if we let this thing fully charge up, which right now is going to take seven turns, there won't even be a penalty for moving, which is another very important thing, because if we found one of those special nodes off of the beaten path over here, I would absolutely put a transmigration uh, beacon down on it and then wait out the seven turns so that I could safely move my home system off the path. All right, you're going to be done here. That's fine. Keep going. Found Tylus. That's a thing. So our goal is to just hack our way as far out as we can right now. We haven't even found a minor faction, so we're not going to go with that. But even if we had, we want science anyway. Science is what we're choosing. So we're going to go with this one, which is discover 10 more systems. That should be very easy for us. It'll give us 200 dust. And the following mission to that should be the one to increase our bandwidth by 10, which is something we'll be doing rather regularly anyway. Oh, my bad. We have hacking operations left. Uh, so this is interesting because it's going to take us two turns. Sorry, my voice cut out there for a second. It's going to take us two turns to hack Staterus and put a sanctuary there. Now the question is, if we we can't even see how many turns it would be from Staterus to Tylus, but if we assume that it's similar, two and then three, this is seven, so it would be three from there, that's going to be done in two turns, so that would be five turns versus seven turns if we decide to wait for Staterus to hack, the, hack Tylus. Uh, the thing about that is, though, that we have a bunch of hacks that are just sort of sitting. Well, not a bunch. We have one hack just sitting. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. It'll probably be faster in the long run anyway. Uh, but that is something you want to consider, especially if you're trying to hack your way closer to an enemy to begin engaging them or something. It is often worth waiting those extra turns just to get the faster hack. Uh, especially if you're hacking an enemy node. If you're hacking an enemy node, you always want to be hacking from as close as possible. Like, the only reason I went for that without waiting was because it's not actually an occupied node. Uh, and that makes it slightly safer. Hello, shoot that over there, and let's go this way and see what we can find. Our main goal here is just to explore as much as we can and to hack all the best goodies. See, Staterus here is a great system for us to hack just because it has five planets we will eventually be able to fill out. Now, even though you hack to get systems, they do have expansion disapproval just like everybody else. You can see that right here. The good news is that there are indeed some happiness improvements that apply to every sanctuary you build immediately upon building them if they're built in your main system. This is once again why our main systems are or why our penalties are so big is because we can take advantage of things like that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put intensive cultivation in queue here. I had left it out because I think I was waiting for the endless research park, which we will end up going after very, very quickly here. But we don't even have xenolinguistics yet, so it's fine to just throw that in queue for now. Uh, we do have our hero here ready to do some scanning. I would like to get him up to level 2 and back onto our home system as a governor as soon as possible here. Uh, and it looks like he may be close, but not quite there. Let's go check what his XP look like. Where you XP at, man? Yeah, he's five experience away. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to split him off into his own fleet. And then send him up here to scan this last thing in Sable, which should give him the level that he needs. 
Uh, and then for this other fleet right here, we'll send them down to continue exploring, as that seems like a very good way to use them. Tychus having only two planets makes it not optimal for us to put a sanctuary here, unfortunately. However, you never know. Like, there, there is always an advantage to controlling more systems. Like, we know that emphatically. Especially if, for example, that planet has some really great anomalies on it or some really great resources. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, we are going to create our first sanctuary in Staturus. Uh, we could go for this tiny Terran right here, which has a bunch of food. And it has our titanium and hyperium resources, but there's also this one right here, which has dust, uh, deciduous trees and super spuds. Sorry, guys, I, I swear, I know all these things, but there's just so many, like, I stumble over the words sometimes. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and select the large ocean, mainly just because it generates more food, and that's something we definitely want to get more of. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take that one, and we will click OK. Oh my god, Windows, please. Sorry guys, Windows has decided that now is the time to give me every notification ever. Uh, and it's actually blocking the screen so that I cannot confirm this. Which is super useful. Oh my god, it keeps doing it. Okay, Windows, here's what I want you to do. Never ever show me another notification again. In fact, since your notification center can't figure out what it's doing, how about you just delete it from the OS? Okay, thanks, bye. All right, there we go. Sorry about that, guys. So now that we've got this, we do have Dacidious trees, uh, abundant deposits, and we have an average deposit of super spuds coming from this planet. The nice thing is we can also get that other planet there and make a sanctuary there, but we do have to run an additional hack to do it. Uh, we've discovered the Calgaros, so we're going to open first contact with them. That's actually a really, really good thing, because that means we can start testing out what hacking does with minor factions, which is a fun thing to do, especially since we are going to basically be skipping over off-world agribusiness, if at all possible. Uh, okay, so Builder of Wonders is now available. Be the first to control three unique star system improvements. We may actually be able to reach that one. And we now have industrial refrains available. So what we're going to do is put that in queue right behind our drone networks. Uh, we want to get that up and running as soon as possible. And quickly after that, we want our cyber farm so that we can grow some more pop. Uh, we still have room for two population here. So I'm not necessarily going to start sending people over to the other sanctuary. Even though doing so might not be a bad idea simply because we don't generate anything if we don't have people there. Uh, that being said, I think we will switch it right now. We'll just go ahead and say, yeah, can you can you send some people over to Staturus, please? That'd be great. Beyond that, these slots right here are the disapproval slots, so we don't really need them anyway. Uh, all right. Everybody will move. We found the remnants. Excellent. I would really like to hack them and get them just because of, you know, the thematic nature of it. But beyond that, the minus 10% to wonder construction is great. The plus 2 dust is great. All of that is great. Industrialism is also super great. We want to go for all the things like that. Uh, so with this little guy, we're going to go ahead and do some investigations right here to find more super spuds available to us. Uh, super spuds as a resource do bring us happiness and lower ship construction costs, which is useful. Especially since, like I was saying later, we'll get that science module that goes on cloaked ships and generates extra science. However, guys, that is all the time we have for this episode, but I do encourage you to check in with us Every day, I'm going to be trying to put up a new video for Penumbra and also a new video of Endless Legend Symbiosis. So thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and click that like button. If you want to see more, click the subscribe button. Maybe toggle that little bell notification thing so that you can let YouTube know you actually do want to see more since that's not what the subscribe button is for. Uh, thank you again for watching. I'll see you next time. Peace. Oh, no.